morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, what I call extractive practice um, in environmental archaeology, in archaeology in general. Um, I've also conducted two surveys. Uh, one is of community archaeology groups. That one didn't go so well. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to that in a moment. Another from... Um, what I think nobody is ever going to call the BGHP community, <laughs> bioarchaeologists, geoarchaeologists, <laughs> human paleoecologists, um, using that label really in reference to the book Meaning and Purpose and uh, a great paper by Ken Thomas who taught me at UCL and is generally um, very entertaining. Um, so extractive practice. Um, I'm not shaming this, it's not wrong, a lot of what I do, a lot of the work I do is in the commercial sector um, and it follows this kind of uh, form that uh, we plan a project, we do the project, it might get published, commercial work, probably not, um, and then it gets read mostly by other researchers. Now I'm going to seize on something that Jim said about being bolder. Um, I want to be really ambitious for in getting uh, environmental archaeology, bioarchaeology, geoarchaeology, and paleoecology into the public domain, it seems perverse to me that people can be operating as archaeologists in an area and have no idea what studies have been carried out on the environment in the past. Um, so I was worrying about this and thinking about this, and I, wanted, I realized there is, there is a sea change going on in general. Um, people are uh, being driven, perhaps, towards um, impact on the research side. Um, and uh, engaging with community archaeology. So I thought I'd have a, ask some community archaeologists what their view of environmental archaeology is, um, and then ask some environmental archaeologists what their view of community archaeology is. Um, so I attempted a survey of community archaeology groups. Now, the survey started in July of 2015. I wrote to the CBA, who said they would share it with their members. I wrote to Archaeology Scotland, who said they would share it with members of the Adopt a Monument project. Um, I wrote to, I've forgotten the name of the project, Tom Dawson's excellent project run from St Andrews looking at coastal erosion in Scotland. He said he'd share it. Um, I shared it on the Britark mailing list. David Connolly, who runs the Badger site, saw this and shared it on the Badger Facebook group. I closed it last week. I received 10 responses. Um, and one of those appears to have been from a commercial archaeology unit in northern Spain. <laughs> um, However, uh, we can perhaps see some, some useful things <laughs> coming out of this, even if it's not a terribly representative survey. Um, there are many hundreds of community archaeology groups in Britain. This is not at all representative. Um, but of the people that responded, 50-50 uh, acts of programme of excavation, I imagine the commercial archaeology group in Spain are probably in the yes camp. Um, seven of the groups answered that they self-fund their excavations. Usually they have participation fees. Um, the others didn't answer. Um, so I thought I'd ask, do you take samples from any of the contexts that you are excavating? Um, three groups said they do take samples and that all the decisions are made by the project director, um, who is generally another community archaeologist. Uh, so there's potentially a problem here, lots of excavations being done. If we can extrapolate from that to uh, anything meaningful about wider community archaeology, <laughs> um, lots of excavation being done with no samples being taken. Um, I then asked, has a professional expert in biological remains or soils and sediments ever worked with you? 50-50 um, split there. And has a student ever studied biological remains or soils and sediments from your excavation? Um, excavations predominantly no. Um, Three text responses. Uh, the specialists are able to add to the overall picture about the site and its environmental context, agricultural practices, etc. Uh, yes, they provided interesting information in to contrast. Sorry, not in contrast to to contrast with the excavation data, um, and lots about uh, wanting to find out more about Cumbria. Um, if you answered no to question five or six, what has prevented you from doing so? These may be a bit sad. Um, there's there are a number of, it's Richard, yeah, Richard's in the room. Um, so apparently a lack of recognition that uh, more recent things are worthy of attention. So there is 
potentially a failure of communication from us here. Um, mid, uh, sorry, 19th to mid 20th site, so environment unlikely to have changed. Um, we're currently excavating the site of a Victorian brickworks, so soil sampling is not required. Um, also, wider points that come up from the other side as well, environmental archaeologists, about uh, lack of funding, um, lack of contacts. Uh, in principle, would you be interested in jointly creating a research plan for a site of interest to your group with an expert in biological remains or soils and sediments? Five out of ten said yes. One out of ten, firmly no. Um, a few silences. Um, I would love to play, and perhaps I'll look at palynology corner here. Um, I would love to play matchmaker um, with the yes if it would be possible to show there has been a decrease in heather in the area. <laughs> um, and yes, we plan to work on a wet slash dry prehistoric landscape next year, so would be very interested. Does your group have a program of talks? Obviously, another route in for environmental archaeology into community archaeology groups is a program of talks, and generally there's some money available for this as well. Um, uh, yes, most of them do have a program of talks. Um, if yes, uh, has an expert in biological remains of soils and sediments ever been a speaker? Generally, no. Um, we have had a plant macrofossil specialist give a talk, and a mollusk specialist has offered to do some workshops. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> would like one to happen, would be very useful, especially if they could do a more hands on mm. workshop. Again, I'm so happy that's in the east of England. I'm so happy to play matchmaker for that. Um, <laughs> No, but this would be a session that I think would be good for the group. I can't remember which group that was. Again, answers that make me a bit sad. If you answered no to no talks from environmental archaeologists, what has prevented you from doing so? As the vast majority of our members are more interested in local history, we do not think there would be sufficient interest. Now, there's potentially a failure of communication from us there as well, because this is local history, isn't it? I mean, it might not be documentary history, but it's very much how your area has changed. Um, uh, don't know, an environmental specialist would be pleased to have a speaker from the region. Again, I'm really happy to play matchmaker. Um, and some other comments, just to close that section. Um, it has been beneficial to our volunteers to realize the purpose of taking soil samples and the information you can learn from them. We would always welcome any input at all on this area. Again, that's the East of England group. Um, I hear mixed stories about those who have worked with specialists. Some are <laughs> better than others. Uh, and uh, yeah, a, a, um, a very uh, hands-on scientist leading a um, a community archaeology group there. Archaeology is surrounded by many specialists. As a field worker gets older, they can either stay in the field or specialise. I'm already a specialist in various fields and exploit these talents to obtain contracts in a community group environment. This is very different. Uh, as an archaeologist, I have to be the specialist at most things, from excavation to report writing. We'd obviously require specialists for particular finds and sampling regimes, but it's usually based on who you know so they can do it cheaply for you <laughs> or as a favour. Um, certain truism there. Okay, so... Using this problematic term, specialists, um, I did a survey of the uh, BGHP community. Um, I ran this one in December, uh, and only actually by posting to the environmental archaeology discussion list on JISC Mail. Um, it was subsequently reposted on the geoarchaeology discussion list. Um, they attracted 48 respondents, which I think is fairly good. Uh, 15 zooarchaeologists, 14 archaeobotanists, 9 geoarchaeologists, 3 palynologists. There are 3 palynologists over here. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. <laughs> um, others included phytoliths, mollusks, not me, and uh, a sclerochronologist. Very exciting. Um, uh, so most were not members of uh, community archaeology groups. It's a good idea if you can join your local community archaeology group. Um, uh, most have, however, given a talk about their specialism to a community archaeology group, and uh, slightly less than half have visited a volunteer-led excavation to give advice relative, relevant to their specialism. Um, if yes, were you paid for this? No, most just did it out of the goodness of their heart in their own time. Have you undertaken specialist analysis on behalf of a community archaeology group? Um, lots of yes. I was actually a bit surprised by quite how many yeses there were there. If yes, were you paid for this? No, again, uh, mostly in their own time. Uh, have you ever delivered training in your specialism to a community archaeology group? I think this is an area 
that we could really grow. Um, uh, quite a few yeses, a few more yeses than I expected. Um, and if yes, will you pay for this? Again, uh, mostly no. Have you ever been involved as a specialist in planning a volunteer-led excavation? This is where I'd love, love this to go. Uh, most people say no. Um, and in principle, are you working with, are you, sorry, are you interested in working with community archaeology groups? Uh, overwhelmingly, yes, which is very good. Um, so why aren't people doing this? Well, time, money, workload. Um, I did a survey about six years ago um, of zoo archaeologists and looking at how they were sharing data online and the same objections came up there, time, money, workload. Um, I'm going to start to think about some ways to manage this at the end. Um, also, lack of interest in geoarchaeology, again, perhaps a communication failure, um, fear of complexity and cost of external input. And, and I wasn't aware of this. HLF grants the obvious route to funding will not support specialist work allied to community archaeology. I don't think that's right. You don't think that's right? Okay. I'm pleased to hear that several <laughs> people don't think that's right, because I didn't think it was either. Um, some advantages, good PR, obviously. Additional data, um, we very much like that. Um, as a wheelchair user, I hope to encourage people with disabilities to take part in archaeology. It doesn't have to be a barrier. Um, of course, a number of us could be quite positive role models for younger people in particular. Um, well, no, not younger people in particular. People. <laughs> fully retract that. Um, <laughs> adds to my local knowledge. Um, satisfaction of working with people actually interested in the subject as opposed to myself. <laughs> um, and better informed they are about environmental archaeology methods, the better their excavations and archaeological results will be. Yes, definitely. Um, a better environmental sampling program, soil descriptions, etc. is better for the whole community. Yes, it is. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, my sort of agenda for, so the, the way I saw our process at the beginning, I know not every process like this, is linear and extractive. You go to a place, you take your samples out of the location, you don't really give anything back. Um, I'm try, trying to advocate for circularity and reciprocity here. Um, so make contact with community archaeology groups, find out what they do. If they have a program of talks, talk. As I said, quite often they have money, they can pay you to do this from their membership uh, fees. Um, find out if your employer might support you running a training workshop. Um, it's quite a good PR thing for uh, archaeology units, museums, local authorities, universities. Um, find out what the community archaeology group wants to achieve and if you can help. Um, can you use funding from specialist society, for example, the AEA have a small research fund, um, or could you use dissertation students if you're working in higher education to further the group's aims? If you're doing this, co-create a research agenda. Don't just impose what you want to study, find out what they want to know, um, and uh, see how you can help. And then communicate your results widely. Um, Get something on the university website if you've done this work. Get it into local media um, and share your data. Jim uh, highlighted the uh, wonders of sharing data and allowing uh, multifocality. Um, tag was worth there. Um, uh, I, I think that community archaeology is a great, uh, great place to for multifocality. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thank you very much.